So today I want to talk about two women athletes that have been denied the ability to run certain races in the Olympic Games. These two athletes from Namibia have been denied this opportunity to run in the Games because they have naturally elevated testosterone levels. This story is just another component of a long racist history of the questioning of women of color's bodies tied to pseudoscience and scientific racism that has fueled Eurocentric discourse and the Olympics for all of their histories. Further, just so we are clear, the two women are in fact cis women. Not that that should matter in this regard, because all women should be allowed to compete regardless of their background. We need to accept that biological essentialism hurts all women and has historically been used to fuel racist and transphobic arguments against women's bodies. This is just another chapter of the exclusion of women in athletics in a form of purity testing that prioritizes certain body types over others, namely cis white women being prioritized over all other body types. The story here ties to an intersection of racism, sexism, and transphobia, and I would like to cover this story from that intersectional understanding. The fact is, this video cannot and will not be able to be all-encompassing and cover every single aspect of every single angle here, but I'll try my best in this regard to cover as much of this as possible in a reasonable amount of time. With that said, I want to start off by examining the main story of these two women and branch off into a number of other stories that tie all of this narrative together in order to explore the larger understanding of the things that I previously mentioned. So let's start off by taking a look at an article from the Associated Press that discusses the story of these two women. Here we have Namibia teenagers barred from Olympic 400 over testosterone. Two 18-year-old runners from Namibia were barred Friday from running in the 400 meters at the Olympics because of high natural testosterone levels, becoming the latest athletes to be affected by the same contentious regulations that sidelined Castor Semenya. And we will come back to her because she will be a central figure in all of this story when we ask about her. But here we have Christine Maboma uh, and Beatrice Masalingi. Uh, who burst into the Olympic medal reckoning with some blisteringly fast times this year, who were subjected to, quote, medical assessments by track governing body World Athletics at their training camp in Italy. They were withdrawn from the 400 meters by the Nambia, uh, Namibian team after the test revealed high natural testosterone, which meant they wouldn't be allowed to run in the 400 in Tokyo. Uh, Miboma had a the seventh fastest time ever recorded by a woman in the 400, and Masalingi had the uh, third highest uh, time or third fastest time in the year 2021. These times, however, spurred World Athletics to order the testosterone tests. It is important to understand that both our athletes were not aware of this condition, said the uh, Namibia Olympic Committee. This situation is reminiscent of the highly controversial sex verification tests conducted on a teenage Semenya when she broke onto the international scene at the 2009 World Championships in Berlin. World Athletics' latest testosterone regulation have been fiercely debated since they were introduced in 2018. So the first question that pops into my head before anything else um, is why these two having really fast times were questioned in the first place. It seems kind of absurd, but it also raises a number of other questions for me. Um, and we need to address these. And I want to address the fact that I will answer them right away after I list them all. But I also want to point out that the answers will come in multiple forms and will arrive multiple times throughout the rest of the video. So first and foremost, would these two athletes have been questioned had they been white women or had they been men? Second, what exactly goes into these sex verification tests and why are they considered necessary? Third, is testosterone even a positive marker of an advantage for these women? Fourth, uh, how does this tie into the stor story of Castor Semenya? So to answer the first question briefly, I want to point out that the record holder for the 400 is actually a white woman named um, Marita Koch, 
who is highly suspected of having taken steroids and yet was never questioned nor had her record taken away. So I don't know if a white woman would have been treated in quite the same way, especially in the modern era. Uh, as for the question on men, the answer is obviously not. Men with high testosterone levels would have been highly prized as having some sort of competitive edge in being admired, whether it's scientific or not. But women who have this are considered to have their gender and sex questioned, especially if they're women of color. Which brings us to our second question about these sex verification tests. Well, the IAFF, uh, sorry, I, yeah, IAAF, or the World Athletics Organization, uh, basically developed a classification for female classification for people running either the 400 uh, meter through the mile races. The new re uh, regulations required any athlete who had a difference of sexual development, a DSD, um, meaning that their uh, circulating testosterone was 5 nanomol per liter or more uh, and is considered to be androgen sensitive to meet the following criteria. Uh, they must be recognized as female or intersex by law and they must work to reduce blood testosterone levels to below 5 nanomoles per liter um, for a continuous period of at least 6 months and thereafter she must maintain her blood testosterone levels below 5 nanomoles per liter continuously to remain in competition. After all, according to World Athletics, quote, no female would have serum levels of natural testosterone at 5 nanomoles per liter or higher unless they have DSD or a tumor. Individuals with DSDs can have very high levels of natural testosterone extending into and even beyond the normal male range. Well, there's so much wrong with this just from the, the get-go. First and foremost, the idea that in some way, shape, or form that this would be tied to making someone less of a woman or less female in this case, and that these athletes are being literally denied that they are part of a female classification is absolutely absurd and ridiculous. And in this case, given that they are conflating gender and sex, they are literally denying these women their womenhood and are asking them that if they want to compete as they are without changing their bodies, they can just go compete with men. But as it stands, they are being asked to change their bodies as women to compete with other women. And that is ridiculous and absurd and leads to potentially dangerous outcomes. And again, this is tied to a lot of racism and transphobia of how women's bodies are supposed to be and how they're supposed to function. And it is again tied to very cis white understandings uh, and Eurocentric understandings of women's bodies, as we will come to show through more of this analysis. Um, these tests are actually very intrusive also, and I just want to uh, cover that by looking at the story of Miss uh, Duty Chand, where she, as an athlete, was also subjected to this gender verification, Three days after being forced to have an ultrasound, the Federation sent a letter titled um, Gender Verification Issue to the Indian Government's Sports Authority, where it has been brought to the notice of the undersigned that there are definite doubts regarding the gender of the athlete Miss Duty Chand. Uh, it is also noted that in the past such cases have, quote, brought embarrassment to the fair name of sports in India. The letter requested the authorities perform a, quote, gender verification test on Chan. And this test included a gynecological exam, an MRI, a testosterone serum test, a chromosomal analysis, as well as an examination of vagina, clitoris, and labia, as well as a breast and pubic hair uh, an analysis that had a five-grade scale. This is absolutely absurd and ridiculous and humiliating. There's no reason anybody should have been subjected to this kind of testing. And when we examine all this and we look at that, we need to take into account that this is something that is really, really messed up and dangerous. And they're examining a lot more than just the hormone of testosterone. They're basically questioning an entire woman's body and trying to determine whether or not she's allowed to compete based on all of these subjective factors. And as we will come to show, this is happening primarily to women of color. So 
Uh, the next question really does become, uh, is testosterone in any way, shape, or form providing a competitive advantage to any of these women? And the fact of the matter is, there's nothing definitive to show that it is. Uh, first of all, labeling testosterone as the male sex hormone is actually really problematic and is really pseudoscientific and is not accurate at all. Um, it's not restricted to men's bodies. It's not alien to women's bodies either. It, women also produce testosterone. Um, and it's part of a healthy functioning of the body. In fact, it's understood that testosterone in uh, cis women in particular could have a wide-ranging effect on metabolism, liver function, bones, muscle, skin, and the brain. And furthermore, if we examine how it affects athletes, the problem with trying to flatten athleticism into a single dimension is illustrated well in a 2004 study published in the Journal of Sports Sciences. The study analyzed testosterone in different types of strength among men who were elite amateur weightlifters and cyclists, or physically fit non-athletes. Weightlifters had higher testosterone than cyclists and showed more explosive strength, but cyclists actually had um, lower testosterone than both other groups, but scored much higher in maximal workload, an endurance type of strength. So actually, there's a correlation between having lower testosterone and having more, um, more long-term strength in terms of endurance, and that there's actually a negative relationship between testosterone and maximal workload. Though this study was small, it's far from an outlier. Similar complex patterns of mixed positive and negative relationships with testosterone are found throughout the literature involving a wide range of sports. So this is a widely contested thing, but if we can draw anything from that, it's that testosterone has a negative impact on endurance, actually. And when we're talking about lengths of running in the 400 meters to a mile range, that significantly would have uh, actually a detrimental effect in some instances. And uh, the IAAF actually showed this when they did a study with more than 1,100 women competing in track and field, where that three out of 11 running events that they uh, covered women with lower testosterone actually did better than those with higher levels. And that's from all different rankings. And so there's no real control group represented there or anything like that, but we can determine that it's not the only factor involved. And certainly there are other things that come into play, probably like training and talent and other aspects. And um, there is just not a correlation between testosterone levels and superior performance like they're asserting. Now, when we get to the issue of uh, Pastor Semenya uh, and, and her entire ordeal that she's gone through at the uh, Fest of the Olympics, um, Pastor Semenya and the cruel history of contested Black femininity. Again, this is part of a long history of Eurocentrism uh, declaring how to examine and view uh, women of color's bodies, especially Black women's bodies. Castor Semenya, um, the regulations on her, are rooted in a long legacy of black bodies being held to white standards. Uh, she won the 2009 World Champions at 18 years old, the same age as the, the Namibia teens that have thus been removed from the Olympics. The sports world, however, whittled the entire story down to just her body. Narrow hips, wide shoulders, pronounced jawline, manly she was declared. Now, I think that's really important to emphasize. She was literally reduced down to her body. All the training that she put in, all of the other components that make up her personality, everything else, that was all removed from the equation. She just became her body and was judged for it. Based on the tones of disgust used to discuss her physicality, one might think that Semenya uh, is the only runner to ever possess a body that so greatly differed from everyone else in the field. However, a lot of men did as well. But unlike those men, Semenya's body is often deemed unwanted and out of place, most notoriously by her sports governing body. Throughout her career, World Athletics, formerly the IAAF, has insisted she undergo intrusive testing and hormone regulation, and ultimately banned her from competition after instituting rule changes that seemingly targeted her in 2019. And we will come back to those rules that specifically targeted her and why they don't make sense. So just keep that in mind. 
Most of the athletes that are being tested are from the global south, and again, that includes mostly women of color. A uh, former top junior athlete, Annette Nagesa, uh, an intersex runner from Uganda, recently just closed that she actually underwent the invasive surgery at the behest of the World Athletics doctors to ensure that she can continue competing, but complications from the procedure led her to be both damaged mentally and physically. Underlying this harsh discriminatory treatment is not simply an adherence to faulty biological metrics or antiquated binary concepts, conceptions of gender, though these aspects have undoubtedly played a role. They really have. Um, a lot of this is tied to transphobia as well as to racism. The idea of the gender binary, how a woman's body is supposed to be, what the levels are supposed to be, all of this is very, very binary conceptions of gender and are tied to very Eurocentric understandings of gender as well, uh, especially in terms of body type, as again, we will come to see. In fact, sex verification practices actually originate as early as the 1950s, um, where unfounded suspicion that some countries were allowing men to compete disguised as women. So again, this comes back to that same transphobic argument that women are going, men are going to sneak in and steal the place of women. Um, and they actually asked women to remove their undergarments to confirm that they were in fact women. Um, which is disturbing. And it actually happened in 1932 to Olympic gold medalist Stella Walsh, uh, where actually later on she was uh, actually determined to have some intersex characteristics. Now, this has to be rooted in history. When early 16th century European explorers encountered uh, people on the African continent, they made a lot of racist stereotypes about them. And over time, such beliefs took a much more gendered tone, with comparisons made between African and European women that not only promoted arbitrary markers of racial difference and inferiority, but also justified the exclusion of African women from the category of women altogether. That is horrific. That is the worst aspects, some of the worst aspects of sexism and racism coming together and creating really dangerous stereotypes that cause a lot of active harm to human bodies. World athletics remains committed to this century-old white supremacist notion that defines womanhood in terms of the white cisgendered female body, rendering everyone else, especially women of African descent, socially unacceptable aberrations. And the unfortunate reality is there's still been pseudoscience peddled since 1995 uh, where Philip Rushton argued that black people are both less intelligent and more impulsive than white and Asian people because they, quote, have heightened levels of testosterone. This is pseudoscience, this is scientific racism, and scientists have spent decades uh, refuting Rushton's claim. However, he was elected to the prestigious Canadian Psychological Association and won a Guggenheim Fellowship. Meanwhile, scientists have had to keep working to debunk his theories because they are exactly that, bunk. They don't have any legitimacy. In fact, there's no significant studies that have ever been done to determine hormone disparities or any biological component that truly separates uh, black and white women from each other. It, this is absurd pseudoscience and scientific racism, and it needs to be acknowledged as such. And when we go into more of the details of what transpired for... Um, Castor Semenya, we have to acknowledge that this racism was inherent even before the testosterone levels were ever checked. Semenya, who burst onto the scene in 2009 to win the 800 meter in scorching time, almost immediately competitors, coaches, federations, and the media began to question whether the 18-year-old athlete was a woman and whether she should be allowed to run against women. And this is a problem. They decided right from the get-go, because she won and she's a black woman, that she had to be questioned of whether or not she's actually a woman. And it, it wasn't even a matter of, oh, well, she did great, you know, and all this stuff, or that she was tested beforehand. No, 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 she won, and then she had to be tested, because how could she win? That's the mentality going on behind this. And when the doctor, the um, Dr. Stefan uh, Berman, had done the analysis and talked about this in a presentation, she, sorry, he depicted uh, the 18th century masterpiece, La Maja Desnuda, with this idealized, almost Venus-looking, sensually curved, nude, white woman 
as the definition of womanhood and defined masculinity as Ken Flex Wheeler, a black, uh, a black bodybuilder that Arnold Schwarzenegger called one of the greatest, and then compared those two images next to a female bodybuilder, or a bodybuilder that's a woman in this case, uh, with bulging muscles, suggesting that the photo represented a woman with high testosterone. And the problem here is should be apparent. The definition of womanhood in this case was a white woman and was the fair sex, as it's called. Uh, you clearly see that what we call, quote, normal male and female, we should not have an overlap in testosterone concentration, as well as you do not have any overlap in the world's best performances. Whatever the event considered, he said. This is, again, that same gender uh, essentialist, biological essentialist, pseudo-scientific uh, garbage that we keep seeing hurt women and put women through these types of scenarios. Now, I need to point out that it's not even the testosterone that's the issue, apparently, according to the IAAF. They ruled that high testosterone must be the result of DSD, differences of sexual development, and not because of things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can also result in elevated testosterone levels. They would not be, those who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, would not be subject to the new restrictions. In other words, the rules are not really about testosterone in the body, but how it got in a body. So it's tied specifically to the fact that it's a natural biological production of this particular woman's body. And that means that the women, uh, the, this rule against women was specifically designed in the moment to target Semenya as she was. And even before Semenya was forced to submit to a barrage of degrading and humiliating tests, as I outlined before on what happened to the other uh, woman that I mentioned, Pierre Weiss, the sec then Secretary General of the IAAF, had voiced his personal opinion. It's clear that she's a woman, but maybe not 100%. And the fact that we can question uh, the percentage of how much of a woman this person is based on biological factors should be considered absurd. First of all, to declare oneself a woman is, is to be a woman. Like, you're, you, gender is a social construct. And in this case, the social construct is not being applied in any way, shape, or form to this woman in an accurate way, let alone biologically in an accurate way, if we were to assume that's the metric to use. This is absurd, and it's tied, again, to scientific racism and to cis white women's bodies and stereotypes. Because she didn't look like the stereotype of this Venus-like voluptuous figure that she was defined to look like, she or she should look like, she was questioned from the get-go after she won her race. And that's absolutely terrifying and sets a terrible precedent on how we should look at women's bodies and women as a whole. Um, like Berman, he used a white northern European lens to determine the femininity of a black woman from the global south. Black female athletes have a long history of being masculinized by white men. Would Berman have even considered using an image of a black woman, or let alone a black woman athlete, as an exemplar of the woman type to, to demonstrate what a woman looks like? It probably never crossed his mind. And for Women athletes from rural areas in the Global South were flagged by the IAAF at the 2012 Olympics for possessing high levels of natural testosterone. And this is not even counting the ones that we've talked about in this conversation. The athletes were then subject to all manners of invasive testing, including inspections of their breasts, genitals, body hair patterns, internal reproductive organs, basic morphology in detail, and interviewed them as to gender identity, behavior, and sexuality. This is why the entire thing is based on a form of sexism, because again, this wouldn't apply to men. It's a form of racism because it's not applying to white women, and it is not, it is cannot be excluded from uh, a transphobic argument because these women are not just being questioned from the fact of a racial component, but from an intersex and possibly trans identity, whether that's true or not. All of these factors are coming to play and intersecting in this moment. So now I want to move on from this and um, I just also want to acknowledge, actually very quickly, the IAAF has spent nearly a decade treating Semenya and other high testosterone black and brown women like they're the greatest enemy of women's sports. They hide behind the claims of science and fairness 
and colorblindness, really. But underneath those arguments is a slide share from 2012 that makes it clear that this isn't about testosterone, or but it's about gender stereotypes and about racism. And when we look at some of the reasons that this is complete bunk um, from that article that draws it to Castor Semenya's ruling being complete nonsense, some key things that I want to highlight in this is that in 2009, Semenya was subjected to the test. They raised the testosterone levels. It wasn't enough. They raised it again in order to bar her in 2018. And it's also very evident that these rules only apply to black athletes because it's only been applied to areas uh, and athletic competitions where black athletes have historically dominated. The two areas where white women typically dominate, the pole vault and the hammer throw, have not added any sort of testosterone regulation as part of the rule. And so it is, again, not tied to white women. Um, they've targeted the mile, an event they didn't even bother testing. Uh, even though it's dominated by black women. The IAAF's rule is completely arbitrary and needs to be acknowledged as such. The range for uh, cisgender women for their testosterone levels, um, I've seen it in different ways, but somewhere between 0.06 and 1.68 nanomoles per liter, according to this. I've seen recordings up to 3.3, um, but at the very least, uh, the normal levels for cisgender men is considered to be 7.7 .7 to 29.4. So five is this arbitrary limit that according to the numbers that the IAAF is using of 1.68 as the high for a cis woman's range, uh, the testosterone levels in women are uh, somehow being over triple that. So it seemed to be specifically targeting a very specific set of women as opposed to anybody outside of the quote-unquote normal range. So if another woman had a level of three or four, which could be over double of the value, it's not an issue. But it's only over five, which happened to specifically target Semenya, that was the issue. And of course, a lot of other uh, black and brown women along the way, which seems to be the only people that they're actually checking and testing. And of course, again, as I pointed out before, it's only in competitions that involve and are dominated by black and brown women, typically. So uh, the other question we need to ask, and this ties back into the idea of whether or not a man would be charged quite the same way or questioned quite the same way. Michael Phelps obliterated records in pretty much everything that he swam. He has double jointed ankles and produces less lactic acid than his competitors. So the question becomes, why is a higher testosterone serum rate considered an unfair advantage when uh, lactic acid, less lactic acid in this case, which uh, makes you less fatigued in your muscles because you have less of the uh, lactic acid to make you feel fatigued, ends up giving you a competitive edge in this regard. So what is it? Why is one body process or one chemical compound an issue when other ones aren't? And if we open up this can of worms and we start breaking this down, we start to realize how much bullshit there really is going on here. And at the end of the day, it really is a messed up thing to ask women to alter their bodies in order to compete in these competitions. The point is, is that they've peak trained their bodies as they are. And we've seen that it's caused damage in at least one woman's body for her to have to undergo a procedure. And really, this shouldn't be an issue. Nobody should have to change their body, especially to white European standards, to formulate and create some sort of comfort for the Olympic committees. And, you know, th it's not just the testosterone that's being targeted in these cases. There's been issues where there's been examinations of other aspects of hormones and other parts of the body that are being looked at and certain... Um, certain uh, procedures that are being performed on women to normalize their bodies, which is really problematic language, again, based on certain cis white uh, stereotypes of what a body is supposed to look like. And we did find that out, um, that it is very much tied to that from that previous article. Um, yeah, this is, this is atrocious. Yeah, we have here that... Uh, some women were forced to undergo vaginoplasties and were placed on estrogen replacement therapy. Like, this is absurd. 
And none of those are going to necessarily affect testosterone levels. It's just about normalizing the body to white cisgender standards. And I, this is slightly in a different area, but I do want to cover this to just show that this racism ties into other areas uh, with the Olympics. Swimming caps are, there is a set of swimming caps that have been designed specifically for natural black hair owned by a black owned company that has put it forward called the soul cap. And this was barred from the Olympics and has been rejected by the International Swimming Federation because, quote, the cap does not fit the natural form of the head. And to their best knowledge, the athletes competing at the international events never used nor required caps of such size and configuration. And not only is this racist and should be overtly so that a cap that would work for the hair of uh, people of color is an issue, especially for um, natural hair, but the caps were originally invented, the one designed by Speedo 50, to prevent Caucasian hair from flowing in the face while swimming. And the fact that they have no understanding that somebody would want to wear or need to wear a larger cap for their hair speaks to the fact that for first and foremost, that women of color are not typically in the swimming meets. In fact, only about 2%, I think it was, of regular swimmers are black. And furthermore, uh, there shouldn't be a recognition of a, quote, normal or natural form of the head. How ridiculous is that? And again, it's tied to that same scientific racism. And we see that consistently throughout these different committees. The whole point in all of this and when we take all of this as a whole, is that it's quite apparent that the Olympics is responding to black women who are trying to compete and are coming up with an excuse to exclude them from the competition based on pseudoscience, scientific racism, and biological essentialism that ties together the intersection of racism, sexism, and transphobia, and specifically prioritizes white cisgendered women's bodies and the experiences that they have and essentializes womanhood even the concept of being a woman, entirely based on white cisgender standards. This control of women's bodies is consistently forcing women to prove that they are indeed women and subjecting them to humiliating, degrading, and ultimately dangerous conditions where they're asked to change their bodies in order to continue to compete. And it needs to stop. And the fact that it is almost exclusively women from the Global South that is being questioned is undoubtedly racist. Because it is because these women do not conform to the expectations of a lot of the white doctors that are running the examinations. No woman, regardless of history, should be scrutinized in this way. Whether you're a woman of color, whether you're a trans woman, or even if you are a cis white woman, you should be allowed to compete in the Olympics. There is no reason why women need to be denied and questioned and subjected to these humiliating and degrading formalities to approve some sort of biological essentialism and to end up, uh, uh, to end up giving any sort of weight or power to continued scientific racism. This really does need to stop. So with that said, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and bell for notifications. You can follow me on Twitter and check out my Discord in the description down below. My name is Anarchist Tara. Thank you for watching.